Meeting is now being recorded. Welcome, everybody. It looks like we have a lot of familiar names and on the call and look forward to sharing this presentation with you today. Welcome to Build This, Not That. We look forward to the opportunity to share some lessons learned about designing as it relates to the greenhouse project experience. And we will be taking questions at the end of the session, but also feel free to use the utilize the chat box throughout. My name is Debbie Wiegand, and my background is that of a licensed nursing home administrator, and I've been a project guide with the Greenhouse Project for the last three and a half years. Also joining me today is Rob Simonetti, project architect with SWBR Architects, and he is a staunch supporter of the model and someone that we certainly enjoy partnering with as he brings tremendous insight and value related to design and also how our core values are fully integrated and lived out in greenhouse homes. Today's presentation is focused on the many lessons learned over the last decade while working with early adopters, CMS, and state regulatory agencies. Seeing is believing, and today you're going to see how this model has evolved and continues to grow because of the transparency and the collaboration of our adopters and visionary leaders. We're going to begin discussing design elements that have moved the needle forward with regulators, learn of associated strategies, and hear about the research implications. Bill Thomas intended this model to be a radical departure from nursing homes as we've known them. It has become the gold standard, and we believe there's always more to learn. So let's begin. Both the design process and the regulatory strategy complement one another to create opportunities for successful outcomes. So let's take a look at how the design process takes into consideration these three components outlined here, and they are known as the regulatory strategies, the experience um, related to those, and how our core values fit in to achieving some of the perceived regulatory hurdles. For more than a decade after the first greenhouse homes were built, the Greenhouse Project remains committed to ensuring that our expansion is underpinned by a strong evidence base of research related to three major things known as our core values. And these values are present in all greenhouse homes, 174-plus across America, and provide essential insight into what makes this model unique and sustainable. You know, those living, visiting, and working in a greenhouse home will often tell us that they can feel the difference when they enter the front door. You know there is a different sense that captures what we call the power of normal. But it's also imperative that we further refine evidence-based outcomes as solutions to share with providers, policymakers, and consumers. The physical, Philosophical and organizational changes inherent in the model's core values provide the opportunity for deep, slip-resistant change that leads to evidence-based outcomes. So let's begin by looking at real homes. This is the most obvious of the core values of the greenhouse model, which transforms the physical environment. The importance of scale contributes to the residential nature of the home, and specific design elements associated with the trademark greenhouse home have proven to be important in supporting a balance between elder and staff needs. A normalized environment on a small scale provides the essential structure to both enable elders and empower staff that work there to create a meaningful life. Looking at meaningful life, this is really about the philosophy of care that an organization envisions, and it's of paramount importance 
and creating a meaningful life. We believe that relationships matter. So deep knowing relationships are really essential to fully actualizing and ensuring that elders have and are able to live meaningful lives. Knowing what matters to one another really creates opportunity for engaging in real life. And it's through deeper ownership of the roles and the responsibilities among the staff through daily routines that help to take on this meaning, while also offering better communication and collaboration among all the stakeholders. One of the most radical aspects of the greenhouse model is the organizational redesign and shifting of power structure that really invites collaboration and participative decision making. We often say this is the least sexy, but probably the most important core value. Achieving an empowered workforce fundamentally requires that leaders believe that the direct care staff possess the ability to make decisions about how care is provide, provided. Trust and belief is essential. My experience is that providers and regulators have a real opportunity to establish more common ground than they might realize. The Greenhouse Project has over a decade plus of experience in developing strategy that creates win-win outcomes. The relationships with state regulatory agencies are critical to building a new environment and introducing this radically different model of care. CMS has noted that the greenhouse model adheres to all federal regulations and supports the design and the elements associated with it. In order to move the field forward with radical design, away from what we've known for the last 50 years, it's essential to bring stakeholders, such as regulators and providers, together for vital collaboration. And so we begin with a formal request to the head of the state regulatory agency to explore what common ground and vision looks like. Secondly, there are common goals among regulators and providers. We know that each state agency is held to a very high standard of protecting the public trust. And that trust is also important to the provider. Introducing a radical innovative model comes with a lot of questions and sometimes anxieties. So establishing a face-to-face -face meeting early on in the process with the regulators on their turf with an advanced agenda and regulatory outline of topics creates an opportunity to hear one another's voices and their concerns while learning about where there's an opportunity to gain further insight into important topics and deeply held beliefs. This meeting early on establishes mutually shared goals and the opportunity to seek innovative strategies in meeting and exceeding regulatory compliance. It's incredibly important to express belief about being able to honor the regulator's values. Regulators want to hear how their state regulations will be honored through innovation rather than just about hearing requirements for waivers or the challenges that exist. Lastly, the Greenhouse Project has partnered with 28 state regulatory departments thus far to understand the specific regulations and to provide education on this model. We work from a belief that both regulators and providers want elders to experience high quality lives in a safe and secure home that offers choice, freedom, and dignity. Our openness to research since inception has yielded numerous evidence-based studies, documented research publications have been shared, and there's ongoing data collection, proving again, time and again, that one, size does matter, meaning smaller is better. And two, home is where people want to live. Various published research articles and facts are shared with the state agency representatives related 
to this type of research. Often new adopters will ask, what are the biggest hurdles? How do you overcome them? And they'll often say, our state is different. That'll never work here. Each of these five hurdles are directly related to a purposeful, non-institutional design. And the elements are directly related to creating a residential environment that puts elders, families, and staff at ease. People see themselves and one another in a different way when the environment looks like home as opposed to a typical nursing home. Changes to the NFPA Life Safety Code now allows for more flexibility related to gas fireplaces, open kitchens, and corridors. As we look to push the envelope and provide more freedom, autonomy, and choice to elders, there are some innovative strategies we can implement related to each of these hurdles. So let's take a look at them a little closer. CMS issued instructions for waivers of specific requirements related to the 2012 edition of the NFPA 101 Life Safety Code in Healthcare Facilities, which now allows for gas fireplaces in common areas. Each waiver, though, is evaluated, and I'll quote this, in the interest of fire safety and to ensure that the facility has followed all life safety code requirements and the equipment has been installed properly. State regulators do have the ability and the right to grant or deny the request. So what is the strategy? It's really about understanding what's going to influence a regulator. It's important to focus early on on exactly what they're saying here, proper installation, proper product labels documented and on file, written policies and procedures related to education of staff, how to turn things on, how to turn them off, what are the proper maintenance procedures, what are you going to do about combust combustibles such as oxygen, the more prepared you are to speak about how to minimize potential harm and the impact that this feature has towards creating real home, the more successful I have found regulators to be in engaging in conversations about having gas fireplaces. Regulators are always interested in knowing how and where medications are going to be stored in a greenhouse home since there are no, quote, nurses' stations or med rooms. The elder bathroom is where, the, the elder bedroom is where medications and treatments can be stored and administered at the bedside in private, and you can see several of the pictures there. There's various methods of storage, and we use these methods as opposed to medication carts, which really are an institutional signpost. We believe these are things that you would see in your home, and therefore this is what you would want to see in a real home, such as a greenhouse. Again, the factors that influence adoption of this method are assuring that locks of medications have been addressed through policy and procedure, making sure there's adequate storage and capacity. So that's thinking through ahead of time what your med administration looks like in advance, the number of medications people are on. Also recognizing task lighting requirements. Those vary from state to state. Oftentimes we're asked where will charts be stored and where is there a charting space. And because of electronic health records, uh, I think that's much more manageable today. What about narcotics? Well, narcotics are generally stored in the office under double lock, and they are put behind a more residential appearing cabinet along with refrigerated medications stored there in the office. The current outcomes show that administering meds at the bedside leads to improved assessments, due to the privacy and the time allowance, and that elders have more communication with the nurse and that there's a deeper knowing that is established between the, el 
the elder and the nurse. Nurses stations are defined loosely across the United States. States are much more focused on the function of a nurses station. And this has evolved over time due to technology such as pagers, cell phones, again, electronic records, electronic Mars, and design. The picture above is an example of how a floor, a floor plan was required to show a designated nurses station, and yet the function of that nurses station is served in multiple areas. The regulations have really not kept up with the changes, and you may have seen some of the latest proposed CMS regulations where they're defining a nurses station now as a centralized staff work area. Regulators are primarily looking for where and how a call system is going to notify direct care workers. And often the kitchen or the office or both has a touchdown space where this system is located. Uh, the type of call system, whether it's audible or paging devices, will influence where it's appropriate to have this system located. The strategy is really about being prepared to explain how your low voltage system is going to address the specific state requirements. Some places allow wireless systems, some require hardwired. Uh, there's audible um, decibels associated with um, some states also. So this is usually a great place for additional education and conversation and collaboration related to the explanation of the staff roles as far as the idea of a versatile worker and how the nurse will flow between the homes and have communication. The 2012 edition of NFPA 101 Life Safety Code revises code to now allow for an open kitchen with special conditions, including that it is within a smoke compartment where residential or commercial cooling equipment is used to prepare meals for 30 or fewer persons. So of course, greenhouse falls under this. This is a new code section that allows for the kitchen to be open to corridors without the need for a fire shutter and some of our earlier adopters did have to have fire shutters. And it allows us to move away from type one commercial hoods. So the kitchen is no longer considered a hazardous area. And I just want to make a comment about the type one hoods that are no longer required. Uh, I find that there are states that are comfortable with this waiver. But oftentimes there is additional conversation, collaboration that will need to happen with local code officials because they sometimes have more stringent requirements and so that's an area to explore. I think that regulators are influenced by, uh, again, having your homework done early on, having things such as shut off valves and switches in place. Uh, fuel sources that are tied to the fire alarm system, lockable sharp drawers, uh, being able to speak to the hood system that you want to put in place, timer switches, not less than 120 minutes for um, shut off of stove tops, using conduction stove tops, which is a closed surface, and then, of course, having your policy and procedures in place to address basics such as hygiene, hand washing, uh, staff presence while cooking. The research tells us that the residential scale of a kitchen creates a sense of home and belonging. So those sights, the smells, the sounds trigger memories and they give meaning to the meals that are being prepared there. And often what we see is that intake increases and families increase their visits um, especially around mealtime. It's a 
it's a much more meaningful opportunity to engage with one another. And just the overall quality of life improves. Corridors. Corridors impact design greatly. They also affect cost. And the design of corridors is one of the most important aspects of the home from an architectural perspective, and it actually impacts all three of the core values. The 2015 edition of NFP 101 Life Safety Code uh, revises the code now to allow nursing home corridors uh, are permitted to be not less than six feet wide in smoke compartments, again, housing not more than 30 patients. Uh, the code commentary also goes on to say, and I think this is important, that this is another change that has been made over the last two revision cycles to create a more home-like setting. So what we see is a gravitation towards more and more real home. So CMS is, is also a real partner in this vision. Uh, previously restricted items placed in the exit corridors are now permissible, uh, such as uh, seating groupings of furniture. And that really impacts and, and enhances resident autonomy and quality of life through what I'll describe as transparency and previewing. And what I mean by that is elders are able to see into a room before making a commitment to enter it that offers them some opportunity around control and decision making. Also, half wall separations will allow for previewing so that elders can ascertain what's happening in a room before they decide to be a part of it. Uh, it's common for the resident sleeping rooms to surround an open space uh, as part of the corridor and part of the living area. Uh, Part of what this does is it allows elders to have less distance to travel when they're choosing to move into these public spaces as opposed to long corridors from their bedrooms. Uh, embracing this regulation equates to really an increased feeling of a, a, residential, a residential feeling, and it improves sight lines for the staff, and there's less square footage dedicated to corridors, which equates to potentially less building costs per square foot. The research says that a smaller environment with few or no corridors equates to higher motor functioning, uh, greater opportunity for friendship formation, relationships, and previewing by elders in being able to choose when and when not to participate. And then, of course, more visual sight lines for staff. So the more residential the character, the lower levels often seen associated with agitation and verbal aggression. So some pretty fantastic outcomes. So this wraps up uh, the top five hurdles related to regulations and strategies that we've used to create success. So now let's hear from Rob Simonetti and the design elements associated with the Greenhouse Project. Excuse me. Thank you, Debbie. Yeah, so let's look at some of the design elements. There are so many to look at in the greenhouse home, and today on our hour, we'll, we'll just look at a few. And those that we look at, we'll look at mostly in the context of the design survey results. Last year, the Greenhouse Project sent out a survey to all of its adopters asking a few simple questions about what has worked, what hasn't worked, what would you do again, and what would you not do again. And there's a lot of useful information that came back in that survey that will educate us and help us uh, move future projects forward. The porches, patios, and yards, um, these have always been important spaces in the greenhouse model. That connection of the elder back to, uh, back to the outdoors is, is, has always been important. So some of the survey comments we see around the exterior spaces are generally about some of the details of how things work. Um, we needed a rail on the back porch, or we only have room for uh, a table of four, so commenting about size. My favorite here in, in Italics uh, is the, uh, we had an elder who had not touched snow in three years that was able to experience this on the porch. And that's 
that's what we're all here for, that that comment and making that happen um, meaningful life throughout the home. So let's look at the approach, uh, some of the portraits and the materials and details of, of the homes. I just want to start with a little case study of a, a project that's uh, starting construction this fall. This is a St. Elizabeth Greenhouse project in, in Rhode Island. This is a, a provider who is constructing four homes, uh, skilled nursing homes, and they really started with this pretty strong idea that we'd like the four homes all connected to a central community area, like a cafe or a, a chapel. Uh, and they were pretty staunch there. But as we began to talk, we really started to talk about, well, what is normal in uh, East Greenwich, Rhode Island? And we all quickly came to agree that, well, it's not normal to push our houses together and connect them by, by a hall. Um, so let's do something else. So at the design charrette, the greenhouse design charrette, we, we came upon this design solution, striving to achieve that quality of community that St. Elizabeth wanted to, uh, to have for the elders. So in this little grouping of, of four homes, um, you know, they're very tightly spaced for easy walking from one house to the next. Uh, they face each other across a small street, so when elders are either in the living room or on the front porch, they can see across the street and, and interact with uh, their neighbors. Again, really create a sense of community between the four homes. But when we look back at the sort of the, the approach to the buildings and the red uh, octagon being the decision point on campus where you either go to the greenhouses or you go to the legacy building, said, well, what's the, the view shed from that spot? What's the approach to the buildings? And, and we quickly see, well, geez, although it creates great community amongst the four homes, maybe it feels like we're turning our back on, on the legacy building and the rest of the, the campus community. So we took another, another shot at this, and we looked at developing those homes around a simple cul-de-sac, which is a very American uh, planning uh, idea. And so e now each of the four homes, they still have community amongst themselves. They, they're all turned in toward the cul-de-sac. So they've got good opportunities for sight lines back and forth between the houses. But now they open up to the rest of the campus. So as I come to that decision point on the road and I approach the buildings, now my view shed is of all the fronts of, of the houses. And if I've got a good view to the houses, the houses and those elders at the front porch have a a great view back out to uh, to the campus and the road, so they can sort of keep track with, of you know what's going on in campus. And so I start the design piece here because I just want to make sure we understand that the design doesn't necessarily start at the front door of the house. That's very important, but it really starts way back here. You know, back up as far as you can when you first see the house. That's that's the start of where the design process should occur. What's the experience of getting to the house? Another house that was well integrated into the community is the St. John's Greenhouse Project up in Rochester, New York, where they embedded two skilled nursing homes right into a new residential development about 15 miles away from their, their legacy campus. And this worked great um, from the model standpoint in that these homes are really embedded in the campus. They've made, been able to make great connections um, and relationships with other people on the campus. There's there's uh, walking trails as well as sidewalks that connect the greenhouse homes to the townhouse homes. Uh, one thing that I like a lot is where in the previous model, St. Elizabeth had been questioning, well, how do we create community and what space do we provide for our elders here on this campus? Because the developer was going to be doing a community building. St. John's didn't have to think of that question. So they built these two houses right next to the lodge, which is the community building for the whole campus. So they didn't have to spend that, those dollars, and now when they need a larger space, they go over there and they rent it for the afternoon, which is great. So this is, this is an awesome model. Of course, when CMS tells us you need separate licensing uh, for each of these little campuses, it becomes difficult. And it's, this becomes diff difficult to replicate at the skilled nursing occupancy. But the assisted living occupancy it's still very easy. It's a great opportunity, and we are seeing assisted living providers doing this very thing, building the small house into the residential community, and it's working great. Uh, another project I wanted to highlight, just because I love this, this Green Hill, uh, West Orange, New Jersey, just in terms of approach to a building and creating community, uh, this is fabulous. You know, the 
you couldn't ask for a better approach to any one of these homes. And you can see the sense of community they have amongst themselves. There's great curb appeal. So the story on this campus really, again, it doesn't start at the front door. It starts way outside the front door. And here, this little quote, it's important to maintain continuity with the past and connect with the familiar. So here, I just want to note that each of these greenhouse homes, they're in a community, and they're, they're based on the, the culture of that community. And likewise, to, to make these homes familiar, the architecture should reflect the community. So here, the uh, West Orange, New Jersey Tudor becomes inspiration for the West Orange Greenhouse. And the Rochester, New York housing uh, development becomes inspiration for the Rochester, New York Greenhouse. And likewise, the, the Rhode Island Cape Cod becomes inspiration for St. Elizabeth's uh, Rhode Island greenhouse. So these connections are important. Um, the buildings and the homes are not just a building that looks residential, that has a peaked roof and a, a gable over the, the front door, but they really truly need to connect back to uh, people's experiences right in their, in their community. Porches, we know, are very important. We, we use our exterior spaces all the time, and elders need uh, that same experience. So it's great to provide a variety of porch experiences and outdoor experiences at the greenhouse homes. So we can see here the uh, Tabitha Lincoln, Nebraska greenhouse with an elder sitting out in the front porch able to connect with the community, um, elders on their back porch, um, just socializing amongst themselves. And oftentimes the, the front porch in any American home is the first room you're able to greet guests into when they come to your house. So these are these are important important spaces, and again, so the house starts outside of the front door. And as many opportunities for variety as we can offer, the better. So enclosed porch, screen porch, open porch, uh, just a roof covering at the back door, all of these allow the elder to engage the outdoors in different ways. And regarding details, there's, there's many, many comments in the uh, design survey about the details and the greenhouse uh, staff can certainly uh, give us more of those insights than we can go over today. But some of the important ones are the coloring of the pavement. We do know that the light gray concrete uh, that we might find on a sidewalk doesn't make for a great patio. The, the glare of sunlight is, uh, inhibits the elders being able to go out and use, use those spaces because of the, the bright glare coming off. So coloring the pavement is really important. Uh, a variety of shading elements like you see here in these images, be it again that just a simple covering over the back door uh, or a trellis or a nice shade tree or the umbrellas. Um, we want to be able to engage in any way, in any way we want uh, with the exterior. And shared amenities are a great opportunity as well. Each of the homes should have their own autonomous dining area, a space where elders can feel like they're outside um, and it's their environment. But when we can group a couple of the homes together and create a larger courtyard, secured courtyard perhaps, that's shared, we really have the opportunity to now add some things. And we've seen this here at the Porter Hills site and at the St. John site. They were able to, uh, to share amenities. And it really creates spaces for bigger social gatherings. Uh, that each of the homes would not have available if they had just their own private courtyard. The kitchen design, uh, lots of comments about the kitchen designs in terms of uh, size and a lot about the appliances and both view to and from from the kitchens. Um, so a couple of the comments here from the design survey are the kitchen is too big, that there's too many steps to get to get what is needed. And then the very next comment from another provider, we need a larger kitchen to allow several people to work more easily together. So these might be kitchens of the exact same size. What's important to understand is when we start the design process, we really have to work hard to understand how is any adopter, how, how are we as an adopter going to implement the model. We can't take a prototype. The greenhouse provides us a framework, but then we bring our own values to it, and we bring our own way of operating the kitchen to it. So it, it needs to start early with that uh, exploring and understanding of how are, how are we going to operate this kitchen. 
On the left, you see um, a kitchen typical of many, I think, earlier greenhouse kitchens. I, I find this sort of a bit easy to understand, especially after hearing Debbie's comments about we know that in the greenhouse model, oftentimes, staff spend a lot of time in the kitchen. They're there cooking. Um, the kitchen may be used for charting. It may be used as that uh, spot that used to be in the old model, the, uh, the nurse station. So you can see here, some of those conversations have impacted the physical manifestation of the kitchen here in the greenhouse home. And we get, we get an inside and we get an outside to the kitchen. And, and there's many little elements that contribute to that. The very high height of the half wall, um, even the, the depth of the header off the ceiling, and the number of pendant lights hanging down. Those things, all serve, those all serve to really enclose the kitchen. And of course, there's gates at either end, making this a staff space, even if it's not really a staff space, even if the adopters didn't mean that, that's how it reads. And you can see if there's an elder sitting here, they're probably going to have pretty limited ability to have a conversation with the staff who may be uh, serving breakfast. So the, the picture on the right is the uh, Danville, Illinois greenhouse project, which really looks like they had a different conversation. Maybe they had a conversation about we, and we are going to gather around the center aisle in the kitchen and, and use the kitchen just like we ideally use it at home and see it used at parties where everyone gathers around the kitchen. There is no in and out or uh, staff versus elder. This is, this is clearly about us and uh, us engaging the house together. So we're learning a lot from some of the earlier physical manifestations of the greenhouse and starting to adopt to that more open feeling, which is a really beautiful job they did there. Uh, on the left is uh, placement and size within the home. This is a good placement of kitchen within the home. Uh, it's right near the back door in the garage, so when deliveries come in uh, of food, they can come straight down a short hall, straight into the pantry, that's ideal, and then straight back into the kitchen. And then likewise, trash and recycles going out a short distance away from the kitchen. There's good sight lines to the dining and uh, to the hearth area and to the front door. But this is actually one of the homes that said, well, this, this kitchen is too big. And that's because this home is operating with just one person doing all the cooking. And these are the images of that of that home. And it's beautiful, but someone, someone finds it a little bit difficult to get around in there. Other things we've learned at this home and at others is that when the cooking appliances are on the back wall, we've got the separation between someone cooking and the elders sitting out at the counter. The person at the, the stove is facing away. So better, if we can, to get the stove out on the island so that the staff member can face, face the elders and have a conversation with them. And if we can't do that, and you do see that done several times, and we end up with this enormous commercial hood hovering above the, above the counter. So if we can't do that, at least getting the stove into an L-shaped relationship with the counter and the elders would be ideal. So if the elders were here along uh, this right, right side of the kitchen, the staff would simply turn uh, their head to the side to, to engage in the conversation. And appliances, many, many comments about appliances. Very typically, we're hearing here again and again, the residential appliances are not lasting. Um, but yet, making a jump to commercial appliances is not necessarily where, where we want to go either. Here are these, these two homes, side-by-side uh, -side images. Both have two refrigerators. One has chosen to do the residential side-by-side, -side, the other, the commercial. And it certainly has an impact on the aesthetic and how an elder or a visitor might want to engage in that kitchen, engage or not engage. So I do understand, as we, we noted, that Every kitchen is operated differently. Um, so if in planning you get, do get to the point of needing commercial grade equipment and refrigeration, maybe we should let's think about putting those elements in the pantry so that they're out of sight but easy, easily accessible and keeping a residential appliance refrigerator in the kitchen uh, for elders to use. Debbie talked about the commercial hood and NFPA now allowing the smaller hood, which is great. Of course, most states have not adopted yet 
2012, uh, but you can push and ask for waivers um, and get that through. These are not necessarily terribly more cost effective, they're actually pretty expensive, but you can see between a commercial type one and this hood, a drastic dip of difference in the ability to create the image of image of home. And in all these appliances and appliances and particularly the dishwasher, we need to be careful of uh, noise, uh, particularly the dishwasher, depending on its placement. We've heard that staff, once they load the dishwasher after a meal and then they run it, they have difficulty then having continuing their conversation with the elders as they stand at the at the sink washing dishes. So we always have to be careful of those placements of each individual client. The hearth areas have generally worked pretty well. You know, most of the comments we've seen are about lighting and about furnishing and about the scale. Um, so a couple of the comments here, what works, the natural light from two directions in the main areas. Uh, someone asked me for smaller square footage, make it more intimate, intimate. let's have less wasted space. Reduce the size of the home and lower the ceilings in the hearth room. Take a look at some of these items. Here, this is a Woodland Park. Uh, it's really a, a beautiful greenhouse home, but the responder to the design survey here said, quote, you know, not, not caring for the unpleasant ceiling uh, light fixtures, and they commented on the ceiling shape. And we take another look at this same project, just a different view. You know, this, this is a, a knockout project. I mean, below the ceiling line, it's just beautiful. The finishes, the materials, it's rich. It's very comfortable, but we've got the ceiling height. And so what it, what's the ceiling height borne by? And it's, it's, it comes back to the planning. So here we have the hearth area, but it's removed from the exterior wall by the sitting area, and then out even further by uh, a sunroom. So the hearth, the hearth room is very distant from the exterior wall. And when we take a look at a very similar scaled room, this is out at St. John's, you know, same amenities, but we bring the ceiling down, and it has just such a, a different, a different character and feel. You know, it's much more higher level of intimacy, it's, and it really comes to the location of this room right on the exterior wall. So these big windows, wall to wall, nearly floor to ceiling, with the transoms, light can can uh, cascade along the ceiling and, and penetrate deep into the house. On the left is the plan of the home that had the high ceiling. And again, very typical. I can understand why this happens. We bring the greenhouse home bedrooms around the hearth room for sight lines. But now the hearth room ends up embedded in the, the core of, of the building, too distant from the, from the outside wall. So here at St. John's, you can see the hearth room, very much the same size, but pulled to the, pulled to the, the exterior wall. And I think we really need to commit to saying every occupiable room in a greenhouse home needs to be on an outside wall. And it's difficult, it's hard to do, but you can do it. So if in the planning process you find yourself adding skylights or a clear story, stop and go backwards. Go back and look at the plan. Because the, the daylight is not just about daylight. We want visual connection to the outdoors. So we need a window that we can see out of, not just a skylight or a clear story. Um, that connection to the outdoors is, is critical. Furnishings and materials. Um, here, this little boy's having a great time. Very comfortable on the floor, on a, on a carpeted floor. I'm sure, he's warm and comfortable visit with grandma. On the right-hand side, another very typical sort of uh, finish. A, a hardwood floor would be beautiful in anyone's, anyone, anyone's living room. But because we, we can't put down an area rug because it would be a tripping hazard, we lose that softness, and we also lose, lose the acoustic value of it. So often in the greenhouse home, particularly in the dining room, you'll see a hard finish on the floor, you've got a hard finish on the ceiling, you've got a lot of windows, which is glass, hard stone around the fireplace, and so the rooms, rooms can become quite loud. So when we're considering the finishes, particularly in the hearth room, really think about carpeting if you can get there. Um, for the experiences of this little boy, as well as for the acoustics. The quantity of furniture in the homes, we've, we've learned early on to not overpopulate um, the homes with furniture. 
they look great on day one when you're taking marketing photos and everything looks like a you know, uh, market rate home. But then when people move in and we need, of course, we need space for people in wheelchairs, we need space for uh, a person's special chairs that they might bring in. And when we put recliners in the bedrooms, oftentimes we find the recliners migrate out to the, uh, to the hearth area. So, and we, we've heard comments of, you know what, we've never used that coffee table. We pushed it up against the wall and we use it as a shelf. So we don't have to spend a lot of money on some of this furniture because we really need these spaces to be, to be open and flexible. And quarter definition that, that Debbie spoke of earlier, these are two greenhouse projects in, in New York State. The Eddy on the left is the first in the state and St. John's on the right is the second in the state. So working with the regulators, you can read from the architecture that it was clear that the regulators likely said, we need to see the corridor, let's define it. So it's defined by the floor finish, it's defined at the ceiling, and it's defined by the fireplace used to anchor the corner of the hearth room on one side and define the corridor on the other. And again, that's a very typical uh, greenhouse response in some of the early models. But, and it works, it works fine works well to see the corridor, but it leaves sometimes the hearth room feeling like an island uh, surrounded by what is truly empty space of, a, of an unused corridor. So at St. John's, the second estate, they went radically the other way and said, we're not going to define the corridor at all. So there's no flooring definition and there's no ceiling definition, but of course there is the eight foot of access space to get to the exits. So this was... Um, a bit difficult with the uh, authority having jurisdiction. It did take a while for us to come to agreement that this was this was appropriate. Uh, but when you walk in the space now, the corridor truly disappears. There is no corridor. There is simply a beautiful living room and a dining room. And it really it really works well. So this is something that has to be approached on a case by case basis uh, in your state with your surveyor to see where where they are comfortable landing with this. In the spa, um, many comments of questioning the use of it. So uh, for those who use it, the elders use the tub, love it. But for as many of those comments, we also see not the comment of not one spa in any of the four houses has ever been used, or our spa is never used. It's down the service hallway to the laundry and storage rooms. And you might say, well, no wonder. Um, but when we look at a, a greenhouse floor plan, and again, I think this is bridging when we're coming in greenhouse, being the first to move from the institution out, some things still get pulled along. So in this, in this floor plan, the bedrooms, which are blue and green, are on one side of the house. <clears throat> Excuse me. The spa is on the other side of the house, and it is with the service area because we think Coming from the institution, the spa needs to be next to the soiled and clean rooms and, and maybe near the nurse station in that environment. So even here, it's even colored the same as the service area. So that's what these folks are thinking about. So what's in, what's in a name? The tub room is that room we cringe when we think about at the institution. And then when we become person-centered, we start to call it bath spa or just spa. And we remodel those tub rooms and we, we put new tile work in and new amenities and we soften them up and make them much nicer. And this is where I think many of the original homes uh, pulled images from. But when we think about home, we probably think about a master bath. So why did, why did so many rooms land here? If I were to ask where does a bath spot go in a home, I'd probably get a wide range of, air, of answers. And some would say near the bedrooms and some would say near the solar utility room. But if I ask, where does a master bath go, I, I think we'd have a much narrower focus of answers. And the answer would likely be right next to the bedrooms, immediately next to the bedrooms. So these two homes, uh, they did locate their bathrooms uh, adjacent to the bedrooms, you know, central as they could to the bedrooms. Uh, this first one on the left, though, is, is very large. This is the one uh, uh, they noted in their design response that the beauty area is often used, the bath spa is rarely if ever used, and the toilet has never been used. So how did, how did this plan come to be? And it came from the conversation around the idea of a spa. 
um, when we have our beauty our beauty time, we don't want to be next to a tub, and so the beauty area gets separated from the spa. And when we're having a spa experience in the tub, we don't want to see a toilet, and so the toilet gets separated from the tub. But now we end up with this room that's 300 square feet, and none of it gets, gets well used because it's cold, it's hard to heat up. Um, at that size, when someone disrobes, it just it feels uncomfortable to be in there. So what we learned from that, we applied to the St. Elizabeth Project and, and in Rhode Island, here we say, you know what, if we're going to have a room that doesn't get used, let's make it half the size. Um, let's limit our risk. So here we're thinking about this bathroom as the master, the master bathroom, and we'll come back to that in just a moment. And again, these are images all of uh, tubs in greenhouse homes. Um, and you can sort of see the transition, again, from the clinical to the most therapeutic. Um, and you know, in the institution, most bathing for hygiene, or all bathing for hygiene, is done in the tub room or the, the spa room. And so those types of equipment were pulled forward, I think, to the greenhouse home. But now in the greenhouse home, we realize that most bathing for hygiene is all done in the resident's private bathroom, and the spa room is really left for, for therapy and for soaking and for relaxation. So we can really start to use different tubs. So the, this tub on the upper right is a very popular tub, but still it needs to be placed into a room of the proper size to get the, the right feeling. And what if, what if we could use these images as inspiration for the greenhouse homes rather than trying to make a tub room more residential? What if we took the beautiful image of a master bathroom and said, what amenities do we need to add to this to provide skilled nursing or assisted living care? And that's just what we did at the St. Elizabeth Project, and we took this image on the right in particular and said, all right, let's use this as our, our image. And so we created that very small master bathroom. And when I'm in a master bathroom, it's perfectly appropriate to see a toilet. We would expect that. Uh, and we've got a tub that's less clinical because our bathing for hygiene being done in the bedroom. So here I'm coming to soak in this uh, Palo Essence tub. And we've got a big, long uh, makeup table where we're going to do our hair and windows to the outside. And in the last wall, we have um, just a vanity sink and a hair hairdresser's sink. So we'll see. Um, we started construction on this uh, in the fall, and we'll come back and we'll report in a couple of years on whether this worked. But at least we're, we've limited our risk, and, and I think because of the size and location right next to the bedrooms, it'll be a much more intimate space that uh, the people will welcome using. So let's stop there. Thank you for joining us. I'm going to turn it back over to Debbie to uh, facilitate asking and answering some questions. Thank you 